All right, hello everybody. My name is Amalia Weber. I'm the program specialist here at Rochester Hills Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program, Healthy Gardens and Landscapes for Pollinators and People. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping details. Firstly, tonight's program will be recorded and available to view about one week from tonight on our YouTube page and on the RHPL website shortly after. We ask that audience members please silence or turn off their cell phones before we begin in order to avoid any disturbances during the presentation. We'd also like to thank the friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library and their many fundraising efforts. It's thanks to their support that we can provide wonderful programming like tonight's presentation. Our next program is George Michael, The Singing Greek, a tribute, which will be an in-person event on Thursday, May 18th at 7 p.m. You can sign up for that at calendar.rhpl.org. And now, without further ado, please welcome our presenters, Stephanie Birdo smith and Marilyn Trent. Hi, good to see you. Um, all right, so I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, is there a show of hands that have native plants in their garden or have been to our presentations of both? You can keep your hands up, either one. Presentations first. Native plants in the gardens. Yes. All right. Um, so uh, who, in this raise of hands, who's familiar? There's a reason for this. Who's familiar with the Rochester pollinators and the work we do? Oh, well, good. All right. Well, I am Marilyn Trent. I'm the founder of um, the Rochester pollinators. I have a company that, um, let's see, next. How are we going to do this? I have a company, I'm the owner of Trent Creative, and I am also a Rochester City Council member. And I have used my platform and my company to help promote native plants, and it's become a passion of mine. And I have been joined here with Stephanie Birdo smith she's the Vice Chair of Rochester Pollinators, and she manages the Rochester Hills Public Library Garden, and she manages the Dinosaur Hill Public uh, Free um, Seed Library, and so much more. And um, we also have Amber Quisenberry, who helped me put this presentation together. Uh, she is not here with us today, and she was sad that she couldn't make it, but she's another vice chair, because I need two of the Rochester pollinators. She's a master gardener, Michigan, master, Michigan national um, naturalist and advisory to the many native plant and garden requests that we get daily now. Um, and Valerie Mullaney is a Wild Ones board of directors and native plant expert and advisor. I give them credit because I can't do this without them, and I need expert advisors to do, especially to do presentations like this. Um, many of you may know that um, I uh, found out in January 2019 that the monarch butterfly was in decline by up to 90%. And it was in the winter, and I'm sitting there thinking, ah, why did this happen? What can I do? And I found out that I can do something, and everyone can do something by planting milkweed and restoring our natural environment with native plants, trees, and shrubs. And I said, well, I have to start telling everybody about this because this is a really, this is good that there's something we can do because I worry about the environment, but I can't really go save a North Atlantic white whale and take the, <laughs> take the entanglements off of them. I can't feed fish to the polar bears, but this was something that I could do. And come, lo and behold, everybody else is thinking, yeah, this is a good idea too. And basically nine out of 10 people, when I start talking about this, which if you get in with a few feet of me, I will. And then I have my brochures ready in my purse and everything else to give them. They go, yeah, I want to, uh, yeah, I want to learn more. So um, yes, our mission is is a nice one. It's a good one. Um, we want to provide education and resources and and uh, to preserve and save the monarch butterfly and the pollinator population. And um, I, what has happened is a community, a real strong community, has been created uh, because of the efforts of my of the Rochester pollinators. Really, the bottom line is make plant awareness to more people and get as many native plants, shrubs, and trees in the ground as fast as we can to feed our pollinators birds and more because they're very hungry and they're being starved to death. Um, who are we? Uh, we are a committee of the Rochester 
uh, City Beautiful Commission, and I say that because we are not a full nonprofit. I have a public-private relationship with the uh, City of Rochester. My, we don't cost the city anything. My company fills in the gaps of the needed, if there's extra money that's needed. But I also uh, work with them in, get, in their gardens on their public lands, and uh, they ha we've gained a lot of trust, and we've had a, a really good time and a great relationship. Um, and, uh, and here's some of us after a rainy day at the farmer's market. Um, I think we just went on about that. We promote and advocate for conservation and sustainability because I found out it was so much more than saving a butterfly, that if you save the monarch butterfly, you can save the rest of the pollinators and you can also learn a lot about uh, conservation and sustainability and it all can be done in your yard and also I've added in the public gardens as well. And what do we do? Well, we've given away hundreds of milkweed plants. We think about maybe 5,000 at this time. Um, we sell native plants in the spring and fall. Uh, we've, planted, we've planted and participated in uh, uh, six pollinator gardens in the city of Rochester. We do these type of speaker and presentations. We donate no native plants to public gardens and schools. And we manage, and we, Imperial Week, uh, Stephanie manages the Free Seed Library with Amber Quisenberry at Dinosaur Hill. And we send out monthly newsletters. We maintain social media channels. And we love to talk about this to anybody who will listen. So what is our impact? Here's just a little chart of what we did over the, up till now. Um, and 31,000 native plants have been sold, 5,000 plants have been given away, 1,700 Facebook followers at this time. We did 34 events and, and presentations last year, <laughs> and we have, it's actually over 145 volunteers. So we also, um, we, won, we are part of the Mayor's Monarch Pledge. Our mayor signed the Mayor's Monarch Pledge in, I think, 2016, and now we are one of four cities in America that have achieved the Monarch Champion City designation by the National Wildlife Federation. We are really proud to do that, and it took a lot of work, and we are just excited to have that designation. So what are you going to learn today? That's what you're here for. Well, we're going to talk about changing mindsets because really that's what we need to all do. Um, and, and what is happening to our pollinators, pets, and people? And is beauty really in the eyes of the beholder? Yeah, we think so. And that's why we need to change mindsets. And will we die if we have small, beautiful flowers in our land and lawns? I think Stephanie said no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then what are herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, and fertilizers are they really bad for people too and we're going to talk about beneficial insects that's stephanie's favorite subject and are native plants always a solution well i think you guys can say yeah you know that we're going to say that way too much okay so when we're talking about changing mindsets um what i'm thinking i want to i want to i thought about this and i have an art background and I love this painting by Monet, um, Woman with a Parasol. And I thought, you know, people will hang this on their wall and they'll think that's beautiful. But this one over on the far left, people think that's beautiful too. But I'm pretty sure I've never seen that hanging on anybody's wall. So that's when we're saying, how do we change mindsets? Because lawn should have gone out of fashion right along with pantaloons. And that was the time when they were popularized by one of our founding fathers in the 1800s when pantaloons were popular, uh, Thomas Jefferson. And the lawn was synonymous uh, with a status symbol, and it still is today. And if you think about it, our, um, it was for the wealthy. And then actually you fast forward to the 1950s, and that's when it really became uh, a status symbol when the suburbs were starting to be created and lawns were part of that, um, part of that um, promotion and push and, and that's when you knew you'd made it when your lawn looked like that. But what I'm here to tell you that today mindsets are changing. This lawn is a part of a homeowners association. This, uh, the story is on the National Fire Wildlife Federation website. These people fought back and they made their lawn um, pollinator friendly and actually very beautiful. So 
many people I have, I wanted to say that I wanted to thank all those who have planted native plants. I asked people to plant native plants and they did. I asked them to plant them in the fall, and many did. I even asked them, I keep upping the ante, would you please leave the leaves because that's where the, the little pollinators overwinter, and they did, as many as they could. And then I asked people to wait in the spring <laughs> and, you know, don't clean up so fast, and they did. And today I'm asking you to take a look at the amount of chemicals and pesticides that we're putting on our lawn and the harm that it does. So Stephanie is going to talk about what is happening to our wildlife before we talk about the use of chemicals. Yes. So what is happening to our wildlife? We're experiencing the sixth mass extinction of wildlife. So if you're not sure what mass extinction means, the world's wide the World Wildlife Federation defines it mass extinction as a short period of geological time in which a high percentage of biodiversity or distinct species such as our bacteria, our fungi, plants, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and vertebrates die out. And it could be just one of those species or multiple. Um, it's important to note when I was giving that definition that it was geological time and I said a short period. But um, this can actually span thousands of, of years or even millions of years. So the last mass extinction actually occurred 65.5 million years ago, and that was what was what caused the wiping out of our dinosaurs. So that's our mass, our last mass extinction. So the sixth mass extinction is actually driven by human activity. So it's primarily our un unsustainable use of land, water, and energy use and our climate change. So today, 40% of all the land has been converted for food production. So why are you asking why is that a problem? It's because we're actually tearing down rainforests and other areas to actually sustain our, that 40% and more for our, for our food and agriculture. So agriculture is actually um, responsible for 90% of our global deforestation and it accounts for 70% of the planet's freshwater use. So species, like ourselves, we don't exist in isolation. When a species goes extinct, a significant, or a significant population decreases, we're all, we're all going to have problems, unfortunately. So and that's sad. That's really, really sad to say and really sad to talk about, but that's why we're here, because there are changes that, that we can make. So you can see, as Marilyn talked about, up to 90% of the eastern monarch butterfly um, population has declined already. So you can see how cl close they are to um, extinction. Um, so in December 2020, the monarch butterfly was actually assessed to be, for 12 months, um, it was studied um, very closely, looking at the population, looking at um, milkweed, looking at eggs, looking at all the different ways that um, the monarch is, life cycle is affected. And unfortunately, it was actually um, found out at that time that um, it wasn't able to be listed as endangered or threatened species under the Endangered Species Act because there were higher priorities. So it's sad to hear that, that that's what happened. So um, unfortunately, other species actually moved up on, on that list. So um, in 2024, they're going to look again at the monarch butterfly and, and see at that time. So we really hope that with the changes that we're making, that that's not even something that, that we'll have to be looked at, that we will have seen a rebound in, in the population. Mm. So 40% of our po pollinators are in decline. Six out of 20 Michigan bumblebees are um, in peril, and three billion birds have disappeared in the last 50 years. What's, what's happening with people? Yep. It, 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 nope, it, it didn't change. It didn't change? No. Ah. Okay. One third of our food supply will disappear without our, po our pollinators. Our water is being polluted, unfortunately, by the chemicals we use in our yards. Damage to infrastructure is caused by our human habits and the climate changing, causing um, increased storms, so increased amount of rainfall in a, in a certain storm, um, higher winds, higher temperatures. 
flooding caused by our human practices um, as far as we're making a lot of cement areas and water doesn't penetrate through that cement. So the water does have to go somewhere. So it's gonna find the path of least resistance. And sometimes that's in our basements. <laughs> <laughs> and climate change is threatening our well, our well, all of our well-being. Did it show up? No. I have to and then what is happening to our pets? Our pets' water is being contaminated by chemicals that we use in our yards. Pets are experiencing 70% higher rate of canine lymphoma when exposed to chemical treated lawns than pets that are not exposed to chemically treated lawns. We're having an increased spread in our parasite borne diseases like heartworm and Lyme disease. Um, ticks are becoming more prevalent in our, in our yards. And um, pets such as dogs, cats, and rabbits are actually having trouble regulating their body temperatures with the increase in our outside temperatures. So which, which will actually cause problems with our, for example, our dogs, our larger dogs. Um, if the temperatures are staying you know, in the 80s, high, high 80s, 90s, or above, our dogs are unable to regulate their temperature. So we're not gonna be able to take our dogs for a walk you know, after 10, 10 a.m. So we'll have that 10 a.m. to, you know, 7 p.m. time frame when we're not gonna be able to get outside with our pets because we're gonna be worried about them having heat stroke, which is definitely fatal um, if not treated and can happen very quickly. So that'll cause more obesity in our pets. And so, and then our do so obesity in our dogs will actually decrease their lifespan. And so that would be really sad. And then um, same with our um, cats. They're actually thinking that um, the increase in temperature is causing our cats to go through puberty earlier than they normally would. And they're having more litters um, at a younger age. And so they're actually, scientists are, believe that temperature um, and the climate change could be the cause of that. So, so our pets are, are being, um, being you know, things are, are harming impacted. them also, impacted yeah. also. So why? We are disrupting nature's healthy balance with our habits. But let's take a look at our gardens and landscapes to see what we can do to help. Because we can do stuff in our own yards, and then we can focus on the bigger and bigger picture. But it's a lot easier, like Marilyn was talking with the butterfly, to look at our home yards and then um, go ahead and, and move on from there. So one of the problems is how we define beauty. So as you can see here, um, these are a couple of our Michigan native plants. Super fantastic plants, great for our pollinators, pollinator magnets, our pollinators love them. But unfortunately, their common names are not names that we really want to plant. So for example, if someone told you, here, you should plant sneezeweed in your yard. You're like, hmm. If someone said, how about Joe pieweed? Mm. How about swamp milkweed? Mm. How about butterfly milkweed? Maybe. I don't, maybe. Well, maybe. I like <laughs> the, the butterfly <laughs> part. But so unfortunately, we've called our beautiful, gorgeous, amazing Michigan native plants by these common names that aren't very beautiful. So you can see here, um, the one with the butterfly on it right here is actually swamp milkweed. It's a beautiful plant. It's actually also called common name rose milkweed. It's the host plant to our monarch butterfly. It's the only, milkweed is the only host plant that our monarchs can survive on. So what they do is they lay their eggs, their baby caterpillars, just like humans can only have milk from milkweed. So they're eating their, the milkweed leaves. So without milkweed, we wouldn't have this beautiful butterfly. Um, the orange one in the corner is actually butterfly milkweed. The beautiful yellow one is sneezeweed. And then the purple one, smaller one under the orange, is joe pieweed. So all very, very beautiful plants and huge pollinator magnets. And please don't let them having the name weed in their name <laughs> defer them. Yes. Just a because mil moment about yeah. the sneezeweed. It was actually called that because it helps with colds. So that was unfortunate. So we, if ch we use uh, part of the Latin name, we call it Helenium, and we, we sell quite a few. And, and, and we know people aren't sneezing, so that's, that's good too. 
<laughs> we, I mean, there's so many common names out there that we kind of switch them out. Swamp milkweed, we're now calling rose milkweed because someone else did, and, and that was really quite pleasant as well. And the other thing that people get confused about is ragweed with goldenrod. Ra ragweed is different, and it causes the um, allergies, but yeah, all the goldenrods and hay fever, but mm -hmm. all the goldenrods do not. Yes, yeah, your goldenrods, actually their pollen is too heavy to actually be carried into the wind. So even though they bloom at the same time, um, it is not the goldenrods that are causing your allergies because their pollen is too heavy to be airborne. Great. So, um, Did yeah. you want to say more? Oh, yeah, go okay. back for one, one okay. more second. So um, the other thing that I wanted to say is I was talking about the caterpillars on the milkweed. Um, something else that we tend to um, talk about with plants is we, don't, we want them to look beautiful and look beautiful all the time. So um, we don't get excited when we go to like bordines and we see bite marks in all their plants or their you know, plants look like they've been um, chomped on. But with our Michigan natives, we should rejoice in that. We should say, oh my goodness, I have so much happening on these plants. I have so much life happening. And we should really rejoice that our plants are um, being used and being, you know, sustaining life. All right, so another, another um, lawn friendly <laughs> flower is actually our dandelion. So our dandelions are a European species but it was naturalized to Michigan. So it's actually been here, um, documented before 1837. Um, it was nearly the whole entire plant can be consumed. Um, the stem itself actually doesn't taste, taste very good and it's pretty inedible because it has the milky substance in it, which is very bitter. But um, everything else on the dandelion can actually be eaten. Um, dandelions are a great source of vitamin A, C, and K, folate, calcium, and potassium. And um, so what I wanted to say and why I said we should rejoice in this is because it actually is a food source not only for, for pollinators, but also for people. And so that instead of looking at our lawns and looking at this beautiful little dandelion popping up in that bright yellow color, we should really look at, you know, hey, this is a great food source for, our, for ourselves even. Very healthy. Another um, flower that we'll find in our, our yards is actually the violet. Um, it's a great early source of food for our spring pollinators. So when they're first emerging, they, they need something to eat. They're hungry. And so this is a great early food for them. It actually supports and attracts 31 species of caterpillars and moss, including the regal um, fritterly, which was recently spotted in a restored prairie in the city of Detroit. And it hasn't been seen or documented since 1931. So it, Goes to, mm -hmm. goes to show when we leave an area undisturbed what can actually happen in that, that area. According to the Chippewa Watershed Conservancy, there are t over 26 native violet species in Michigan. And the violet is such a pretty flower um, that is actually the state flower in Illinois, Rhode Island, New Jersey, and Wisconsin. I thought that that fact was, was pretty interesting because it's another common um, flower we don't want in our lawns, and I thought it was really neat to, to hear that four states embraced it as, as their um, state flower. So another flower that we may see if we live more in a wooded area is the spring beauty, which is a, is a beautiful, um, so it's Claytonia virginica. And it's primarily pollinated actually by flies and bees. And it actually, this picture, it's harder to tell from this picture, but there's actually small pink lines on the petals. And it's actually um, thought that that is what the bees and the flies use to, um, they'll see those pink lines and that directs them to where to go to get nectar. And, and actually the pink lines will reflect UV radiation. Um, which is very interesting um, for the pollinators because a lot of times they use the UV radiation and light to actually find their flowers as opposed to we can't see that. So we're drawn to flowers because of their coloring. All right, Marilyn, let's talk about chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Well, I don't think there's very good news about chemicals. I was looking for it, but I couldn't find it. Um, and right here, you can see that 30 of the most commonly used pesticides are, uh, but of, are kind of bad, really bad. 16 of them are carcinogens, 21 cause reproductive effects, 15 are neurotoxins, 13 cause birth defects, 25 uh, cause liver kidney damage, and this is what they're using every day. Um, so then, there, let's start with insecticides. The problem is they're often used for cosmetic solutions, and that's part of what we're discussing today too. Why, you know, it's 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 really decorative, so you don't really need it in agriculture. Yes, they're using chemicals. No, do I think they should use all the ones they know? Of course not, not me, but they do. But they actually have a purpose because they're feeding people. These chemicals have no purpose, really, <laughs> um, in my opinion. Um, and they also uh, pollute the environment and it hurts people's and people and pets. Um, it kills beneficial insects, even though they, they say it's targeted, it can't be. No insecticides are safe, um, not even organic. Uh, and then there's my most unfavorite is neonicotinoids. They kill butterflies, bees, and birds. Um, then mosquito spray kills all mosquitoes and other insects and application of insecticides to protect homes harms beneficial, like I said, in, insects outside of homes. So neonicotinoids, also known as neonic, is basically a single coated seed with a neonic, which is nicotine, and it can kill a field sparrow with one tenth of a treated coated seed, and it can impair, it can impair a bird's reproduction. Um, there are some people who are saving birds, you know, the bird, um, um, what do you call those? Uh, people who, they the rehab, the rehabs that save birds and they hate this season because they're getting these baby birds that have come in contact with some kind of neonics through their, 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 their little mother giving them something that has neonics in it and they're dead or they're, they can't save them. And sometimes they call it the bee killing pesticide. They're often used as a main cause of declining bee populations, according to Chicago Audubon Society. Um, and the problem with it's a toxic chemical has been and continue to be used on decorative plants. And they, it started as a agricultural insecticide, I mean, to, um, because it, they need something to replace DDT. And we all know they had to ban that. And now, you know, uh, this is the next problem. The insecticide is being overused and it kills beneficial insects. They, the, the bigger problem is that they are systemic and that means that the whole plant becomes toxic. So everything from the leaves to the nectar and the pollen in the plants bloom. And the systemic problem co continues as the plant lives or dies. The pesticide will poison the insects and more and then leach into our water and be absorbed into fish, birds, and wildlife and the food chain. And here is a um, graph that shows you how, how it does it. It starts over here um, when it's sprayed on the, on the crops and injected into trees and coated onto the seeds. Then it seed spillage in a single seed, so it kills the songbird. And, and, they, and the neonex, because it's in the coating and it spreads, it grows this way throughout the plant if it's coming this way. And then the plant gets bigger and bigger. And then the seed fragments, dust and sprays, they spread the neonex into the soils and the wetlands. And the bees can pick up neonex from the poison here as it's also coming in both ends and then to our water sources and into our uh, watershed. And there's the mom. She's not knowing that she's giving her baby poison. And it's just really, it's bad all the way around. And there is a bill at, 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 the, at the state called H House Bill 4895, um, banning, requesting to ban neonics on public lands. There, you know, no one wants to go after agriculture. That would be very difficult. But, and it hasn't gotten out of the Agriculture Committee. 
I myself got our city to ban it from our public lands because most public most cities don't use it. It is a it's a very bad poison. But for the ones that do, they should ban it. Um, so read the labels because there was a public outcry. So the solution is read labels, learn what you're what you're buying, read the labels on the chemicals. But because there was a public outcry of the big box stores, and they reacted by um, ban, they don't sell it anymore, and if they do, they have to have a, a, well, they have to say what it is. Because what happened is people were going to the stores, buying the milkweed with neonics in it to save their caterpillars. The caterpillars died, they really were upset, and that caused them to, it took a couple of years to, to respond. So that was really cool, because that's Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, Costco, true, val true value. So what we're trying to protect in Michigan, because we, is, is our 450 species of native bees and our 460 bird species. So I, here we are, next one, herbicides and pesticides. And herbicides eliminate food sources by killing flowers that are used for foraging. What is, example, it's a violet. Yeah, it's a violet. Yes. Yep, dandelion, yeah. the spring beauty. And, they've all, and herbicides have also, and pesticides have shown to alter a bee's ability to navigate and suppress a bee's immune system. They try to tell you it doesn't, but there's so many studies that show that it does and the decline, it's all, it's all really pretty much cataloged and, and, and really researched to the nth degree. So again, read your labels. But here's the solution, Roundup, which had glyphosate in it, it will be banned this year. Um, Bayer will stop selling glyphosate in, U to, in U.S. lawn and garden markets starting this year. Hopefully, I was reading it. I was looking up. It's May. I don't know. It's still. It's you know. I know. I saw it on the shelves. I. I don't know, and maybe they call the end of 2023 December 31st. <laughs> um, but it's banned in more than 20 countries. Uh, because it's been linked to the increased risk of non-Hodgkin lymphoma and other types of cancer in people and pets, and it's because they've been sued for billions of dollars. Lots of dollars. Um, so then there's fungicides, uh, causing symptoms of causes symptoms of malnutrition in pollinators, and the fungicides on flowers cause major decline in bumblebee larvae, not the bumblebee itself. So when they, when they probably are doing these tests, for fungicides, and they said, this isn't going to cause, well, whoever did it, I won't name names. <laughs> They're working hard trying to come up with a pesticide, a fungicide that won't kill bees. And what it didn't do, it didn't kill the adult bee, but it had a huge impact on the larva. So, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that was the problem. And it took quite a bit of research to figure that out. So what they said is, and I'll go into that solution next. Oh, it's on the next slide. Sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Interacting with in, in, interacting with insecticides and fungi increases toxic, toxicity. And then here's names I can never. I have a really hard time pronouncing these names. And I guess I would just say, if you can't pronounce the name, just don't use it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So don't use them, is what I would say. But if you do, and I read this, if you do, spray before you, they, the bloom, they bloom or spray after they bloom. Because it's in the bloom that the, that the bumblebee gets that nectar or pollen, and they take it back to the, their nest. And then they have the little baby, and it's something in there. I was reading about it. Some kind of yeast or fungi kills the larvae. So each fungicide causes different levels of harm, is what I read and researched. And then we have our fertilizers. So runoff from fertilizers uh, pollutes our waterway, wa waterways, gets into our stormwater. It causes algae blooms that create dead zones which kill fish and other aquatic species if you're near a lake. Poison aquatic life that are later consumed by people. Um, it ruins so soil by causing compaction, reduces soil organic matter, and kills beneficial microbes. And so what can you do about that? Well, for your garden, it's not so much your lawn um, that you can use composted soil because it's good for your plants. And if you're planting native plants, it doesn't need as much 
um, uh, nutrients. So that's a good thing for native plants. And I guess we're just going to keep harping on that. <laughs> I mean, that's what we do. Um, and if you leave the leaves, they break down and enrich your uh, garden and, gra and grass as well. Um, you have to be careful, obviously, on your lawn. The other I about you can't leave very many leaves there. I get that. But I also thought if you just had your um, lawn uh, provider, if you have one, or if you're thinking about you want to do it, just do it once in the spring and once in the fall. They, they're really over fertilized. They, their job, lawn maintenance people, <laughs> their job is to give you lots of fertilizer and lots of chemicals just because, and, and they can cut back and you know nothing bad will happen, I swear. Right? Call me if something does because I'll, I'll come try to do something about it. <laughs> so read your labels, cut back on chemical intervention. I mean, we say no to all pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides, but we know in a perfect world that's what we want. But we're not advocating revolution. We're talking about evolutionary steps. Try it, do what you can, and at least thanks for coming to hear us tell why we think you should quit using them. Um, and then, like here, I said, I looked up ways. Like if you do, you have to. There's like um, buttthorn or something. They will spot, um, spot treat it because you can't seem to kill that <laughs> and so and then uh, Phragmites they've had to use the spot treatment I think of the glyphosate or something to kill them as well but not this broad just spray it all because that is what's killing so many insects that we depend upon and then I know it's like hand pull your weeds that is okay, that's a thing that you can still do I do it you know, and I said, of course, check labels, check plants to see that if they have neonics in them, they are, they are supposed to tell you, like, you know, your nutrition labels on the back of food for humans. Um, and then just say no to fertilizers. <laughs> Use alternatives like compost. Um, so then we talk about biological controls because that's nature. Nature knew what, I think it's a lady, uh, they call her, they say she's a lady, so I'll go <laughs> along with that. Nature knew what she was doing and for millions and millions of years. So she had all these biological controls in place and humans were disruptors. And they came in and they decided, well, okay, we're gonna replace all these prairies, all, all these grasses that were here. We're gonna put turf grass that doesn't come from here. And then what do we have to do? We can't depend on nature because nature doesn't know what to do with it here. So nature, you have to add in more water, you have to water it more up to, it's called 60 million acres of water a year is what we use on our 40 million acres of land. And we spend $40 billion a year on our, on our turf grass upkeep. And we, not me, <laughs> but some people can spend up to six hours or more a day or a weekend uh, keeping up with it. So um, there are, um, Insects are the little things that, that run the world. And without them, they are the decomposers that are working hard. You see them in the natural areas. And they are holding us, our the world together without them. Unfortunately, what I've read, and it looks kind of true, it, the, the planet would start collapsing because it, you, you gotta keep recycling and, and you have to keep part of this bigger ecosystem. You have to keep it changing all the time. So beneficial insects uh, perform these a valuable task and so you can see what it says here um, consider placing your plants prone to disease with hardier pest resistant plants when you see your plants are being by eaten by a pest change and it's not a native change it to a native plant why fight nature and that's what I'm saying if you don't fight it if we can get our, our boot off of nature's neck nature is resilient and it does bounce back if we don't starve it or poison it, then we have hope. Okay. So now we're going to talk about a few of those beneficial insects. And there are a lot more than, than you think, but we're just going to talk about a, a couple here today. So you can see on the far side, it's actually called a blue dasher dragonfly. And it's on top of a, um, the red flower stalk um, that you see is actually a cardinal flower. Um, beautiful Michigan native. Um, yep, right there. And so this is actually from my own backyard. So I have a small um, man-made pond that, that we hand dug. And so this dragonfly was visiting and eating my mosquitoes. So that's, um, they can eat 
thousands of mosquitoes in a day. They can eat 10% of their body weight um, each, each day. Um, so this mosquito, or this um, dragonfly will um, lay eggs on the top of my aquatic plants. And then when those eggs hatch, they'll actually be in the center here is what dragonfly larvae look like. So it's aquatic. Yep, right in the middle there. So it's enlarged so that you can see it better. It's not not that big, but it's not that much. Right? It looks, looks like a, mo a monster. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Make friends with it real quick. <laughs> right. right. So it's not, it's not that large. It's actually um, a little bit smaller than the dragonfly itself. So because the dragonfly will then um, emerge into the dragonfly itself, so the larva. But this, this larva right here will actually eat the mosquito larva. So when mosquitoes come into my yard um, and, you know, lay eggs and then their larvae are in my water, my dragonfly larva has food now. So it'll hurry up and eat those mosquitoes. And I really don't have that big of a problem in, in my, my own yard. Um, oh, go back oh, for one sorry. second. Um, this other one is dam damselflies. Um, same thing. Their larva looks very similar, um, a little bit smaller um, than the dragonfly larva, but they're, they're great um, at controlling insects in your yard. So, and it's also a telltale sign that you have clean water in, in your pond or water, water areas that you have these dragonflies there. Okay, you can go to the next one. They would be in there too, yes. Yep, yeah, and actually, um, if you were to take, if you were to go there and take a sweep of the, the water in the vernal ponds, you should see the dragonfly larva there. And they're taking care of the, those mosquito pr problems. Yeah, so they're, they're great to have, and they really do. They'll just zip right around, so kind of cool to have by, by your head. So another one is um, ladybugs. So ladybugs are amazing at eating aphids. They love them. It's their favorite. Um, they can actually um, consume, besides aphids, um, scale, mites, mealybugs. They do um, sometimes eat some certain caterpillars they, and eggs and mites. So, but, they, but their larvae, there's actually four stages to a ladybug's life cycle. And actually, all four stages, they look completely different. So if you've never seen an egg of a ladybug, if you've never seen the larva, the pupa of the ladybug, and you've only just seen the ladybug itself, it's amazing. The larva itself looks like a little um, like armored vehicle. And so it goes through four different changes. Um, and it's actually black and yellow. And if you do have any um, swamp or rose milkweed in your yard, and when you get those yellow aphids, um, you will start to see these little army cars um, eating away at the aphids. Um, in the different stages, because it goes through four different changes, um, they usually consume anywhere from 15 aphids a day to 50 aphids a day. So they're really chomping away at those little aphids and taking care of them. So if you see them on your milkweed, not a problem. Those little armored cars are, are coming. So the life cycle of the ladybug is actually two years. So from egg to the adult you see here. And then um, the, life, the life expectancy of a ladybug is actually a year. So it'll live a year as the beautiful ladybug that we have here. So, but a great um, control of those that we don't want in our yard. Um, so here's a lacewing. Um, they also are a great, um, it, you know, in, insect to have in your yard. You may see they like to lay eggs, and it has, so it kind of looks like needles. So their egg will be on top of a very fine piece of um, material that they, that they use to put their egg on. And so it's really cool. So it's very delicate. And, and pretty. So if you see this, you have lacewings in, in your yard. And so they, again, they eat the aphids, scales, mites, um, all those small insects that um, we might not quite want in our yard, but we really need in our yard because they support this beautiful um, predator. Um, parasitic wasp. Um, something interesting about parasitic wasps are that they like the tomato hornworm. 
And so tomato hornworm are not gardener's friends, as we know, because um, they will devour your tomato plants in a very short period of time. So what this parasitic wasp does is actually injects its eggs onto the hornworm. And so you'll see the hornworm is a green, it's a really cool looking um, caterpillar. And then what will happen is the parasitic wasp larva will hatch and then they'll actually consume the tomato hornworm. So instead of having to spray your tomato plants to protect for the horn, hornworm eating away at your potato plant, tomato plants, you can have these parasitic wasps come do their thing and the parasitic wasps are not harmful to us and um, are not a stinging insect to where, you know, that we, ha we have to worry about them. But they're a fantastic predator, fantastic. Um, the surfid fly, again, it's um, another beautiful um, fly. It's also called the hoverfly, and it also consumes those aphids, those leaf hoppers, scales, and, and caterpillars. And then a favorite is fireflies. They're so, they're so beautiful. It's great in June and July where you see them twinkling in our backyards. So um, interesting thing about the larva of fireflies is that it's actually in the ground. And they can be there for um, two years in the ground. And they consume slugs, snails, worms, and other insects. And the larva itself does um, bioluminesce also. And another favorite of ours is spiders. Um, <laughs> I know, I know it's not, I know, I, I love insects. Um, this is called a crab spider. And you can see it's sitting in butterfly milkweed. And it do, this one doesn't sp spin a web. Um, it's just kind of hanging out there and it's, it's looking for um, its prey. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so another really cool, you know, we, I know that spiders can be creepy, and, um, but they really do take care of a lot of our um, insect species. But. So um, the solution with having these insects is that it attracts our birds and our butterflies, our birds and our bats to our backyards and our butterflies. But um, so it's important that because if we were to use those insecticides and we would eliminate those fantastic bugs that I just showed you, we would also be causing problems for our birds and our and our bats. So bats are voracious um, consumers of our insects, especially our, our mosquitoes. So definitely someone we want to have in in our backyards and our and birds too. Um, ways that you can attract them besides having the bugs in your yard is by having bird houses um, to attract your birds and then they'll be on patrol during the day and then you can also install a bat house so that you have your bats on patrol at night so you have like all the security happening in your yard and you don't even have to have to worry and then installing a water feature um, and, and with having a water feature, um, if you have, if you add some, like a bubbler, an aerator to it, um, that stops your mosquitoes from being able to, um, you know, lay their larva in there. Um, but if they do, I mean, some may get in there, but like we talked about, those dragonfly larvae are going to take care of the problem for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Oh, you're going to talk about the chickadees? Yes. Yep, so the bird that you see pictured here is actually a chickadee. Um, they make a really cool sound. They'll say chickadee dee dee when they're, they're in the area talking to each other. So a pair of chickadees um, needs, needs 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to rear just one clutch of young birds. So that could be you know, anywhere from one to four birds. So if you imagine um, having to go make 300 trips to the grocery store in a day because that's what what they're doing so they're quickly jutting off um, and they can't go far if you think about it because their babies are there and hungry and they don't want their babies getting upset so they'll quickly go find their caterpillars because if you think about it a caterpillar is a nice juicy soft-bodied insect 
So when you have a baby bird and you're feeding them 300 times a day, um, you have to quickly shove it in their mouth, take off, <laughs> go find the next food, and come back. So we're unable to, they're, or they're unable to feed their young bird seed. Um, they're also unable to feed their, their young um, hard-shelled insects, so like beetles. Because if you think about it, just the, that action would actually cause a lot of damage to their throats. And they're just unable to, to handle that in their little bodies. So that's why they need all these caterpillars, because they are very hungry. And those caterpillars are very soft. So another solution would be to plant native. So as um, Marilyn has talked about and I've, I've talked about too, um, the thing about native, our Michigan native plants are they're used to our weather. So April was cold, and then it was 80 degrees, and then it went back cold again, and then May has been kind of cold. So our native plants, the seeds, know the proper time to emerge so they're waiting you know they know that the weather can be kind of crazy we could get a lot of rain we could get a little rain so they're waiting for that perfect time to emerge so that's what's a benefit of the native plants is that you don't they, they're not delicate they're not um you know they're not needing to be covered at night because of frost um, they're they're able to survive it all um, a lot of our beneficial insects co-evolved with our native plants and have for thousands of years. And having them in our yard causes the, ha the habitat to draw other insects and, and more and more wildlife to our yards. And um, with having a diverse assortment of native plants in your yard, you're going to attract more and more of those great beneficial insects that, mm -hmm. and more um, biodiversity to your yard. All right, so another problem is um, impervious surfaces and man-made structures uh, because the water um, was typically, before these impervious uh, surfaces were brought to our land here, uh, the water would come down on the trees, it'd go down to the soil, then that, that soil would clean it, and then it would go into our rivers, but now it's going, you know, it has to, it has to move around from our driveways, our patios, our sidewalks, our roofs, so, um, and the roofs are, you know, um, sitting in it right into our yard, and so we all understand that, and um, so there are ways to um, uh, mitigate that as well, and, um, and any chemicals in and your roof or your driveways are going into the storm water. So what can you do? You can add rain barrels to your downspouts to collect water to use, to use in your garden. To, you can do it slowly. And you can plant a rain garden. And we've talked about that in other presentations. Um, and because the native plants help that erosion control by holding the soil in place because they have really long roots. And the next slide I'll show you is the long roots compared to non-native plants that the native plants have. And they absorb more water and than exotic plants. They prevent flooding, flooding and they are a superior water filter. And this was, uh, I saw, I, I, um, one of my friends, Jane Giblin, who's had a native garden since, um, I don't know, the 1990s, when I first, when I saw this chart, I really started understanding how Michigan native plants, even though it was part of our heritage and part of our land ma management, how, why it made sense. And uh, the lead plant over here could go, uh, shrub can be up to 15 feet. Um, the little bitty guy over there is our famous turf grass that we've been talking badly about, uh, talking smack. <laughs> And then we've got a day lily, two or three feet. But most of the non-natives are about two or three feet. So this chart really shows how um, long these roots are and why, wh where, what happens below the surface is as much as important as what's happening above. So I did talk about uh, too much turf grass. I think we get it now, over 40 million acres. Um, a valuable ecological re uh, uh, real estate is taken up by our lawns. It's the largest agricultural product, I guess you'd say, without feeding us. Um, so it's basically kind of a hot mess <laughs> in a way that there's just a no upside to your turf grass. So we do need it 
as well. We know that people need their turf grass. So we're just saying, take another look at it, kind of reduce it, maybe in half, a third, add something, add some native plants, add more, find out if you like them, if they're friendly, if they're not attacking you or anything, you know, maybe you'll, you know, let them hang around. Um, but because, because what we've created are these ecological um, wastelands. Um, and um, native flowering plant plant plants, trees, and shrubs benefit nature and you. I think we've made that clear. Uh, they also, they, they besides the biodiversity and, and the food and shelter for our wildlife, they don't require chemicals and they, because they don't need them. They need little watering. I don't know that, no, some people have gotten, after a couple of years, you can get up to no watering. Um, and we talked about their, um, uh, their um, benefit of the extensive root systems and things you can do today without costing money so mowing the lawn higher for weed and grub control that's okay you don't have to mow it down so low and you don't have to use landscaping cloths because they don't work a uh, home, home I, I moved into 10 years ago I guess I'm a little <laughs> I guess I'm not up on landscaping cloth because I'm digging around. I'm like, what, what is this cloth doing in my yard? And it wasn't doing any good. The weeds were coming right up. I thought, wow. So I'm just keep every once in a while I'm pulling out cloth. Um, it's really bad for the environment. And the other thing that you can use tools that are made to pluck out weeds. I guess a cool tool does cost, obviously, but only once, and you can pluck those weeds out. You can aerate your lawn. And the other thing is, take, step, take 10 steps back. You know, if you don't see it close up, don't worry. You know, don't worry about those details. Grubs won't destroy your lawn, and they, then the predators let them do their job because they eat these grubs, like your robins, your blue jays, ants, ground beetles. <laughs> oh, oh, geez, well, because they. They'd eat them. Oh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Right. Are you okay? <laughs> and you're here and you're okay. <laughs> oh, I see. Wow, I didn't know that. That's good to know. Right. Well, they're just trying to kill. They're they're really just trying to sell chemicals. So, I think that's my 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 idea. So you know, we are getting down to the end of the hour. Yes. I don't. I think it well, is. What is this? An was it? A, was almost. it an hour? What? Oh, it's an hour and a half. Oh my gosh, you poor guys. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have. We okay. Have almost. All, right. All right. So we understand if you have to stand up and stretch and you know do the hokey pokey. <laughs> Okay, okay, I just wanted to make sure. We have a few more slides, so I wanted to make sure everybody was okay. No one's gotten up and left yet, so, all right, so. So another um, problem we'll that we have in our, our backyards is actually lack of habitat. So unfortunately, we're being a little bit too tidy, and our tidiness is actually not supporting um, these caterpillars and eggs and chrysalis and cocoons and moss and larvae because um, what we're doing because they need that leaf litter to hide in to camouflage themselves so that they're not found by the predators of birds and, and other animals but um, they also need that leaf litter to stay warm too um, so they're going down and having that layer of insulation that soft layer um, to insulate on, on when the snow is on top of it helps with their survival too um, so removing um, stems um, and leaf litter um, the stems itself will actually destroy our native bees. Um, so Maryland had talked about in another slide that we have over 460 native um, bees in, in Michigan. So when we think of bees, we actually think of the, humming, the honey bee. But the honey bee is actually a European bee. And so it's actually not native to here. 
but our native bees will actually use the hollow stems of plants, and then that's actually where they'll put their larvae. Another spot that um, our ground nesting bees will do, they, they do need an area that's cleared of um, debris and just d have dirt there so that they can actually lay their larva there. But if we, um, in the fall, cut everything down and remove all those stems, actually we're getting rid of um, potential places for our, our native bees to um, lay their, their eggs and for their larvae to develop. And these are solitary bees, so they're not, um, you know, in a hive. So they're just, you know, doing, doing their thing, raising their little family, and then, and then moving on. Minding their own business. Yep, just That's moving. Right. And then we also need to leave um, dead wood. So I don't know if anyone's been to the Rochester Municipal Park. There's um, our, a hybrid garden there. And um, the, our city landscaper, um, Bart, has left some beautiful, gorgeous pieces of um, trees. And mm -hmm. it actually yeah. it, like is a beautiful element to the garden because you have these different shaped logs that are all twisted and just it's really beautiful um, but the reason why that's actually there is to help the insects because that's another place for them to have a home but so if you haven't checked it out check it out it's beautiful it's gorgeous it's it's a work of art and has function too yeah and it is a hybrid garden it's a mixture of annuals and non-natives and native plants and it was interesting the first part of the garden he Bart, um, he, he was, he's great because he collaborated with us. So he put less, n um, less natives in the first, there was two phases, first phase less, and then second phase he embraced them and it's, it's filled with native plants. So it was really nice to see that. Yeah, so something else that you can do is you um, can create a certified wildlife habitat in your own yard by going to the National Wildlife Federation. And some of the um, points that you'll need for your yard is food, so native plants would be a check for, for that box. Um, water, so you can have a, a bird bath, you could have a small pond, you could have a water feature um, to check off that box. Um, some cover, so this would be shelter. So. Um, when you have any leaves that uh, any sticks that fall down or leaf material, you could actually dedicate an area of your yard, and that could just be an area where you leave that. Um, you leave some sticks, um, you leave some leaves, and that can be a shelter area for um, our our birds to go or other wildlife to go and hide. Um, places to raise young and sustainable practices. So just making sure that you're trying your best to have a healthy backyard for those animals. And so exotic plants, the problem, they use a little bit more resources than, well, for sure more than our native plants, but also the, it's a lot of work for us to keep up with those exotic plants. So in a typical landscape, um, that you see in more of a new build or just around town. Um, most of the plants are 60 to 80% non-native plants. So what we are doing is we're introducing European plants and Asian plants into our landscapes and we don't have the native plants that, that we were discussing earlier. And so what that is doing is causing us to need to use fertilizers because we are introducing them into soil that's not their native soil. We're introducing them to a climate that's not their native climate um, as far as temperature goes, water goes. And then um, introducing not having the host, like not having the insects to be the host, and so then they kind of just hang out there and might become overgrown and things that we have to take care of, where our native plants um, have, have the ho host there. So our solution is um, well, plant, plant native. I you couldn't guess. And <laughs> yes, not that you couldn't, you couldn't guess what our, no, right. I don't know, I don't think so. And, and we're definitely, as Marilyn said, there's a lot of fantastic um, plants from Europe and Asia. Like, they're gorgeous and we, you know, just if, if you can and if you have a choice, look at the, the natives and see, you know, is there something that looks similar to this plant that I really love and maybe try to plant that. Or if it's something where you know you have a shrub or a tree that needs to be replaced, maybe look to our native plants. 
Um, and, and we're definitely not saying that, you know, go home tonight and take out all your non native plants. All your grass, right. all your plants. <laughs> please, <laughs> please don't think we're, we're right, definitely not be. saying that <laughs> because there's um, gardening is a hobby and, and a love and something that's passed on from, fa from you know, family to family. So, you, you know, I, I would go outside with my grandpa and pick raspberries, and then he would show me all his favorite plants, and then we would turn over rocks and look for insects. So, I mean, I have in my own yard plants that my grandpa loved, and they're non-native, and but it's a love for me because it's a memory and it reminds me of, of my grandpa. But I also have learned a little bit more, and um, I've changed what my parents' landscape looked like, and I've changed mine. So I have a little bit more Michigan natives, or a mm -hmm. yeah. lot of Michigan <laughs> natives in my, in my own yard, um, because I did learn about this, and I, I did want to be able to make a difference. Yeah, yep, and she only lives a few doors down from me, so I can attest to that. Um, <laughs> she's a little tidier than me, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so let's see, we have what, something called light pollution, and I wanted to introduce that because just it was something new that I learned. I kind of knew about it, but I wasn't sure, and I looked it up, and I've been doing some research and reading, and regular LED lighting wrecks havoc on natural body rhythms in both humans and animals, and it disrupts an, an animal migrations, habitat formation, wake sleep habits, and you know, I mean, number one, I used to see a lot of moths around my LED, but I don't see moths at all anymore because of the decline. And that was in the 90s and early 2000s, the decline started happening. Now, if I see a moth, I'm like, hey, do you need a pillow, a glass of wine? <laughs> Can I help you? Because <laughs> I don't see them very often. Yeah, and moths are huge night pollinators. Yeah, and so, um, so uh, it kills insects drawn to the light, source disrupting food sources for other animals and Pollination. So what is the solution? They have, they have one. It's yellow lights and easy outdoor lighting solution. So it's easy and ex inexpensive to switch. So, and what I always say, it's kind of like if your non-natives start dying, you know, it's time to put in a, not, in a native. When your lights um, uh, die and, and they need to be replaced, I guess die isn't the word, but when they need to be replaced, you can replace them with yellow lights. And um, even better, they can be paired with a motion sensor. And the resource uh, that I've been looking at most is International Dark Sky Association at darksky.org. And I got this um, infographic off of their website because protecting the night sky starts with you. Um, light only what you need. Use energy efficient bulbs and only as bright as you need. Shield lights and direct them down if you so desire. Um, only use light when you need it. You can put a timer. Choose warm white light bulbs, which is a yellow, and join IDA. <laughs> we need your help to continue to fight against light pollution because it's hard on the birds as well and uh, if they're out at night. And June bugs and mm -hmm. fireflies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I know. And you know, we all live close to each other and, you know, <laughs> Some people have more light love for lights than others. So, um, yes, plant native. Attract fireflies to your yard with native plants and turn off the lights and enjoy nature's light show. So another there you go, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Not your favorite insect, is it? No, it is. I really it like mosquitoes. It kind of is. Well, it's, yeah, probably. I mean, just as long as they don't bite you. Right. <laughs> but so another problem that we might encounter in our backyards is mosquitoes. So unfortunately, um, the sprays are not safe. Um, and they actually will unfortunately kill all our pollinators. So it's, um, the spray is not specific to mosquito. Um, and since mosquitoes can fly around, you know, they'll just leave your yard and then come back later. So it also can be inefficient. Um, some mosquito deterrents, like thermosal, um, is toxic to bees, birds, fish, and cats. And bug zappers, as Marilyn was talking about, um, kills all insects. Um, and releases bacteria and viruses into the air from the electrocuted bugs. 
So there is a solution. There is, there is a safe mosquito control solution. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that in, after a rain, we dump out um, the bottom of our flower pots because um, that can be an area with standing water in it where mosquitoes could lay their eggs and larvae could, could be. Um, and you could do the same in um, bird baths if you wanted to dump them out, or you could aerate that so that then that way um, mosquitoes won't look at that as a place to reproduce. Um, double check your gutters, because um, that actually could be clo have clogs and then causing standing water there. Um, so there are ways to have a gutter guard on top of it so that the leaf litter and debris doesn't fall in there and, and cause those clogs that could actually back up water, which also would cause winter damage to your house too. So it's kind of a win-win to check, check that out. Um, there is tablets called mosquito dunks and they're pretty inexpensive that you get. Those actually will kill mosquito larvae and they are actually the, the, the chemical inside of them w is targeted specifically to mosquito larvae. So if you did have an area of standing water that you couldn't aerate and didn't have dragonfly larvae in or some other control, you can use these mosquito dunks and put them in there and it will not cause any problems to fish in that, in that spot, um, will not cause any problems to dragonfly larvae and is um, specifically targeted to the mosquito larva. Um, spray repellent on yourself. Um, there's a lot more clothing that actually has repellent built into it, so wearing that clothing. When you're eating outside in the evening, um, a fan is huge for, mosquitoes can't fly through that, that wind that's generated by a fan, so having a fan going is a great um, mosquito deterrent and <laughs> citronella too. All right. Well, we're coming to the end here, and um, I always say that collectively, individual actions can make a difference, and collectively, four years later, individual actions are making a difference. And people call me in there, they eat a lot of emails, not very many calls, but mostly emails or when I run into them at the farmer's market at other, at other places or events, they tell me that, they, that, these, that planting native plants has brought joy back to their life, that their yard is now, it has life, and they never saw that before. They hadn't seen butterflies in years, and the butterflies have returned. And we all depend on nature, our natural world for survival. And it's, it's, and it's also an ecologically solvable problem that each one of us can do, which I, I love that. And it's easy to just go natural with your landscapes and gardens. It's not that hard. It's like now you get to relax and maybe enjoy more of your life. <laughs> you plant Michigan native plants. It's our heritage. It's an American heritage. We don't want to lose it. And the butterflies and the pollinators will come. And meet you. Get, I got to meet so many nice people, more people. We have poll, I have new pollinator friends, and I have a lot of wonderful pollinator conversations. Um, okay, kill the lawn. <laughs> Start out with that. <laughs> if you want to dive deeper in the deep end, <laughs> there is um, uh, Dan Jeff, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Wilder. Jeff is Wilder has a YouTube video I just was watching. And he calls it kill the lawn, but he says that's to get people's attention because he really basically says do the best you can, and he has a lot of great information there. Xerxes.org, they have um, information. Let's see, I have some handouts. Um, we have handouts that I can email you because if you are working with your HOA, um, Xerxes has these. No, it's monarchguard.com, sorry. And how to avoid weed inspectors. So we've got two <laughs> weed inspector. Did you? Well, oh my gosh. Well, I, I love your t-shirt. It yeah. says stay, stay wild. wild. Yes. <laughs> um, so these, uh, if you put your name on our email list and you say you want this email to you, um, I guess just put a Y, <laughs> so you don't have to say, please email me this. Just put a Y next to your name or email, and we will email these two to you. Yeah, we have our um, a sign-up board in the, in the back if you wanted to sign up for our newsletter. 
And also in the back, we have a brochure that has a butterfly garden that uh, my team designed and hired an illustrator. Shelly's nodding her head. She planted one. We have Shelly Brown over here at the end. And she said it worked out. We were hoping it would because it was a designer, me, and some advisors that created this. So then I had an illustrator um, draw the plants so people could see them and, and, you know, look at the heights and get the colors and things like that. This brochure was such a hot item. I only have a few left. So they are on the back table because it's for our farmer's market native plant sale on the 20th and the 27th. You can go to rochesterpollinators.org. We got plenty of these cards um, and you can pre-order online. We have plenty of save 10% 10, 10 off and one free native plant when you come pick up your plant if you have this card and it has the pre-order 10% off on, as, on it as well. So um, also Michigan Audubon has this wonderful and we also have it on ours. Oh, you can get it. Uh, you, it's hard to find garden plans. So this um, uh, booklet we got off of the Michigan Audubon website. It's also on ours under resources and maybe easier to find. And we also have our garden guide that has a plethora of information about, um, with it we have um, information on um, native replacements for non-native shrubs and we have a list of nectar rich annuals and we have um, mini garden plans um, and just a lot a lot of information in there and that's online as well um, wildflower association of michigan is the state wildflower association and they have a lot of information you can join them if you want to join some if you want to join a club <laughs> of native a plant organiz organization or association uh, Rochester pollinators, it, we're, we, we, we like people, so what we do is, and we love our volunteers, um, we don't, we don't have, we don't, we're not a membership organization. Uh, we kind of put people to work, so if you want to hang out with us, we, um, we ask you to volunteer, and we have a great time. Ask Shelly, Shelly and some, uh, does a lot of volunteering. This is her second year or third, second, yeah. Um, National Wildlife, uh, so, uh, Wildlife Federation is a great resource, and the rest are as two. Prairie Moon and Prairie Nursery are out of Wisconsin, but they are in the same native plant. Most, uh, um, yeah, most of their plants will, can grow here or are native to mm -hmm. Michigan, too. So they're a good resource. And, they, and you could go there, and they explain all the plants. They have a lot of garden plants. It's really a great resource. And then you can also join Wild Ones. I'm a member, Stephanie's a member. That is a membership organization, and they have, that's, I've learned so much from them, and I'm on their board as well. And what you can do to help, well, you know, we already told you the first one, <laughs> and we told you the second one, and we also told you, I don't know, only purchase the real Michigan native plants. They are difficult to find. When you source them, there are a few um, native, there are a few nurseries that carry them, but when you're looking at them, if you want to make sure they're Michigan natives, you have to look at the Latin name, you have to know what that is, um, and that um, that's how you can identify them. More and more, we're trying to encourage our nurseries to carry them, it's a little hard. Uh, ask your local nursery, so that's the only way they'll start carrying them. The few that are available are on our website. Um, come and share, uh, come to our events and share um, and share your stories. Send us photos of what you're doing. We love to hear from people. Um, our email address is on this, like I said, you can get a little card here. You can always email us, we're always available. Um, and like our Facebook page. I, I wanted to say one more thing about native plants you buy at the nursery. If you see that it has a name to it, like, um like passion fruit coneflower. <laughs> I don't. I'm not sure if that's even a real, real name. But if you see that on there and it's actually in like quotations, that actually means that it's a cultivar, so that it was actually a, that actually used to be a plant that um, had this you know, maybe pretty color or double bloom. And so then it was continually um, cultivated um, for that specific characteristic. Um, so we caution you on those because sometimes, especially with like double blooms, um, sometimes that can prevent pollinators from actually getting pollen from the plant. So just be careful. Um, some, some of them are just the color and so that yeah. can 
that can be fine, but you do have to be careful depending on what is different about that plant from its original species. It, it could not be usable for our insects. So, so yes, we're about done. Yeah. Does that work? Does it work? Uh, oh, that offers another organic solution. solution. That was very difficult to find. So that is a interesting. Yeah, because then that would actually so. So anything that would that you would add to it would affect the soil and the microbes and the inner workings of the soil itself could change. And so then you could actually, by adding the salt, um, could make that area, you know, yeah, like a desert. Yeah, I mean, right. I guess you could. It is, for sure, it is. Yeah, I mean, probably not. But yes. I, mean, I, mean, not, I mean, you could try a little bit, see what happens. Probably not the best. Right. I, it's not one that, yeah. And we don't, actually, I was going to tell everyone if we do not have, there are not very many solutions to mitigate this except replacing, restoring, you know, managing. But the organic solutions we've lo looked up are, are, are pretty slim. I, I contacted a company that said they do, or they were in Detroit. A young, a young woman has started a lawn care company, and she had some organic um, uh, names of, uh, that I didn't recognize. And I, was, I contacted her, her two weeks ago saying, what are you using that is natural? And I never got anything back. So, yeah, I mean. I, Yes, so we will continue to look for that, and if we find out anything, we'll put it on Facebook. Yeah. But we want to thank everyone for coming, and you can ask any questions that you yeah. like. Yeah, oh, here's a couple of books. <laughs> if you want to know more about bees and what they know, this is a good book to read. It's, it's very dense, but it's very interesting. There's a new Northern Gardener's Guide to Native Plants and Pollinators, which is a really good book that's just been published that Doug Tallamy has blessed and he's a gardening, um, he's our um, backyard, he founded the Backyard Native Plant Movement and the other book is The Good Gardener. So we are, there are books and more books being um, pr um, written and published because this has become a movement. It, it really has, it's become a movement. I have a question. Yeah. Just curiosity, my whole garden, I have a lot of milkweed stuff. I developed a milkweed bug, bugs and I had never seen them anywhere before, mm -hmm. and I want to know what they do. Nobody seems to know anything about them. Mm -hmm. They didn't seem to cause some damage that I did. No, no. no, yeah, a lot of times they'll eat this, the seed pod. But yeah, they're just, yeah, they're just part of the healthy ecosystem. Yeah, they're... Well, they, no, they were other places, but they they're little red ones, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Red yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. black and red bugs. Yeah, yeah. they're just part of the ecosystem. I, I Yes. <laughs> well, that's good. No, they don't. They really don't. No. Yeah. There. Are yeah. Thank you all. I mean, I have, I'll take more questions, but <laughs> yeah. I did want to take a moment yeah, and thank, thank you, you all because you are an excellent audience. This is a lot of material, yes. and, I, and I hope you learned something. But we'll take more questions for yeah. sure. What? Um, no, you do have to be careful with the right of way to prevent people from being able to see. So with the 18 inches, like so, if you if someone was like backing out of their driveway, there are rules in the city of Rochester and Rochester Hills about um, height of plants, but um, in the front in yard. the front yard, yeah. yeah. The, hell, the hell strips, you know, those little strips that in, they're called hell strips that are between the road and the, and the sidewalk. Those um, in Rochester, they some people have planted native plants and they haven't said anything yet. <laughs> so not yet. So I mean, you know, there's I guess not too many of them. So 
Actually, Jane Giblin did yeah. it. Jane, one of our um, um, one of our most famous <laughs> pollinator members. Yeah. Pollinator members. She's Jane Giblin has her whole front yard and trees and shrubs and um, plants, and yeah. she's made it um, look really nice and um, has not had any really complaints that I know of. Well, they haven't made her stop. I mean, yeah. She's no, she's, she's in she's Rochester, Rochester Hills. Hills at Christian Hills. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if you ever drive on Barton Drive, you will notice right away that that. Yeah, I, I know. I know. But maybe they'll come around eventually. Yes? Yes? A lot of them are. Yes. Yeah. A lot of them are. If they, get, if they get tall enough, some of them are more than others. We look for the, the real, you know, like nodding wild onion. They will not eat. Um, yes. And Milkweed. They, no, they will not they eat butterfly like or the rose milkweed. Yeah, they, they will not eat. They will not. Yeah. Um, Black-eyed Susans, they'll chomp on. They don't seem to love purple cone flower, but they don't like the um, yeah, That's they don't like the fuzzy leaved. Um, and then you'll you'll also notice that sometimes the fawns will um, test out plants. So sometimes, unfortunately, it'll be a plant that they shouldn't eat that should be deer resistant, but the, the babies well, are, you know, the babies are out of control. <laughs> there are shrubby yes. sinkafoils. So I planted, I have a deal with the deer in the cemetery, and I'm trying <laughs> not. <laughs> I, <laughs> the deal is, I plant plants to see if they like them, and if they don't, then I plant more. And if they do, it's not a good deal for them because I quit planting them because they eat them. Yeah. So I put coneflower. Not, uh, not eating a wild onion because uh, they don't like savory I read and then shrubby sinkafoil and then the milkweed so they are surviving they kind of nibbled a little bit but they did not touch the shrubby sinkafoil it's a little shrubby bush with a lot of yellow flowers on it I'm going to try some more um, this, this year because I started it last year yeah, um, beard tongue is also one that they, ha they haven't touched. Um, so out here at the west entrance is our um, pollinator garden here um, that, that the Rochester pollinators take care of. And pretty much the only thing that the deer will um, nibble at is the black-eyed Susans, but everything else. Yeah, they'll, they'll nibble. They, well, they don't. Yeah. They shouldn't. And they've told that we, the deer don't really like mine. Either. Yeah, they, they'll they nibble at the ones out here. The but is, if, if you got a lot of things, they don't mow it down. It's like if you only have a couple of things and they're really hungry, they will eat it. I mean, you, if you give them a big choice. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. I, that's the only plant that I had. And then when I first started planting, they did uproot a couple milkweed. And it was the fawns because of like based on the timing that it happened. But um, but yeah, I haven't. I mean, and then there's other plants surrounding it. So once those plants get taller, the deer kind of move on and don't don't really touch it. But. Did you? Thank you. Okay. Oh, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go, well, go ahead and clap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>